good morning today we will uh, uh, we will cover the next topic this trebismus actually this was to be covered by dr munish i am taking on his behalf okay so what is trebismus uh, you have all studied in the previous lecture in the previous lecture you have all studied these tests muscles anatomy now we move bit now we move to a bit of the clinical aspect of trabismus okay and uh, as a clinical aspect of trabismus we have to remember for example usually we see an object for example i am seeing this object when we see the object the line of sight of both the eyes the line of sight of this eye the line of sight of this eye will be intersecting on this object and the image of this object will form at the fovea of both the retina that is in the macular area of both the retina this point you have understood whenever there is an imbalance of the extraocular muscles you remember the extraocular muscles superior rectus inferior rectus medial rectus lateral rectus superior oblique inferior oblique whenever there is imbalance of this muscle especially in the primary position one eye is not aligned so one eye may not be aligned one eye may not be aligned to the visual axis of the other eye and this is known as trabismus and in simple english the squint with trabismus while one eye well with trabismus while one eye while one eye is fixating on the object the other eye deviates deviates in some other direction either inward when it is known as cross eye outward when it is known as wall eye upward or downward as a result the person may either experience diplopia that is the double vision but means one object he may see the object as two because of the misalignment of the two eyes or or the brain may suppress the image of one eye that is the eye which is not uh, not fixating on the object the brain may suppress that image leading to leading to the preferred eye that is a fixating eye having a single vision and the other eye turns into amblyopia because of the suppression later on the angle of deviation of the trabismic eye is measured in prism diopter and how is it measured we have already seen using a prism bar test prism bar test so when the trabismic eye is aligned inward it is known as esotropia eso when the eye the trabismic eye is moved outward it is known as exotropia x exotropia with x when the eye when the one eye is when the one eye prime is in the primary position and the other eye moves upward it is known as hypertropia when the one fixating eye is in the primary position and the other eye moves downward and the other eye moves downward it is known as hypotropia so here is an example of a esotropia in a child that is the inward movement of this the inward that is a medial medial alignment of the trabismus eye and the child is fixating with this eye and you can see the light reflex in the cornea of this child what is the classification of esotropia we all we, we all know that whenever we accommodate whenever we accommodate it has three parts that is the near reflex the convergence and the pupil meiosis whenever we uh, we class this is these three are the parts of accommodation the near reflex the pupillary meiosis and the convergence so the one of the causes of esotropia is related to accommodation causes the accommodation which is used to see the nearby objects by the eye it is a physiological mechanism one of the causes of esotropia is accommodate accommodation it can be either excess accommodation or less accommodation we will see 
and the other isotropia is classified as a non accommodative causes in which accommodation plays no role in which accommodation plays no role so the causes related to accommodative isotropia can be subclassified into refractive causes and non refractive causes in the non refractive causes it can be the convergence excess what does convergence excess mean convergence excess related to the accommodation uh, for example we have to see this object for this our full accommodation has to play the role that we have to converge the eye we have to see this we, uh, the pupil will meiose and the ciliary muscles will accommodate ciliary muscles will accommodate accordingly the lens shape will change okay now if there is a convergence excess for example for this we have to accommodate this much that is a normal accommodation but there is convergence excess that the eye will move for that the eye will move more inward relative to the accommodation needed for this object it is known as convergence excess or there can be accommodation weakness for example for seeing this object we have to converge a bit but the eye does not accommodate normally that is the ciliary muscle does not accommodate normally it is known as accommodative weakness for seeing this object we will accommodate much more and therefore it will appear as if it is a convergence excess but it is actually accommodation weakness so the non refractive accommodative isotropic causes are convergence excess or accommodation weakness the refractive causes of accommodative isotropia are in which there is a fully accommodative isotropia or there is a partially accommodative isotropia that is partially accommodative means it is related partially to the accommodation and partially to the non accommodative cause what are the non accommodative causes of isotropia they can be classified as essential infantile isotropia as we saw in the essential infantile isotropia as we saw in this image microtropia very minor about four prism diopter isotropia is known as microtropia basic isotropia convergence isotropia convergence spasm will convergence spasm due to medial rectus divergence is insufficiency on looking at distance convergence spasm on looking at near divergence insufficiency on looking at distance or divergence paralysis on looking at distance physiologically whenever we look at a near object our eyes converge and whenever we look at the far objects our eyes diverge eyes converge our eyes diverge okay the sensory isotropia when the when the sensation of vision is when the sensation of light or of from the object doesn't reach the eye consecutive isotropia after the surgery for the exotropia acute onset isotropia due to some neurological causes or a cyclic isotropia due to a neurologic cause exotropia when the fixating eye is looking at you and the other the strabismus eye moves outwards it is known as exotropia we can see the corneal reflexes here the corneal reflex has has come in and the eye has moved outwards the classification of exotropia can be constant early onset exotropia in childhood intermittent exotropia in which the eye moves into a exotropic that is the outside position whenever the eye is overstressed okay whenever uh, the patient wants to relax the eye from the work it is doing the eye moves outward and after some time the eye again moves in it is known as intermittent exotropia remember it is not uh, latent strabismus okay latent strabismus is seen only after breakage of fusion here there is no breakage of fusion still the eye moves outward and after some time again the two eyes are aligned straight and this is known as intermittent exotropia and this is generally due to anisometropia then there is a sensory exotropia in which one eye is amblyopic and uh, and the uh, norm and with time moves towards the outside resting position consecutive exotropia is seen after the surgery for isotropia when there is excessive correction 
on the basis of fixation strabismus can be classified into alternating and monoocular what is alternating strabismus in this there is a spontaneous alteration of fixation from one eye to the other for some time my for example my right eye is fixating on this object and the left eye is strabismic and for some other time my left eye will fixate on this and my right eye will move into a strabismic position it can be monoocular when there is a definite preference for fixation with one eye for example if my right eye constantly focuses on this object and my left eye is always in a swing position that is a strabismic position that is always lined outwards or inwards it is known as a monoocular strabismus on the basis of onset strabismus can be classified into congenital and acquired what is a congenital strabismus we label the strabismus as being congenital when the deviation is documented before the age of 6 months that is related to the any defect present at birth and the more appropriate term for this congenital strabismus will be the infantile strabismus it can be acquired it when the deviation is when the deviation has a later onset that is after a period of a normal apparent visual development it is referred to as acquired strabismus were in committing strabismus committing strabismus is when the uh, deviation angle remains same in different positions of gaze in different secondary position of gaze the deviation angle remains the same between the two eyes what is incommitting strabismus it is the strabismus when the deviation angle changes with the uh with the different gazes uh, we have already uh, covered this in the previous uh, previous video and the incommitting strabismus one of the reasons is the paralytic strabismus in which the extraocular muscles are paralyzed either medial rectus is paralyzed that is third nerve palsy or a lateral rectus that is sixth nerve palsy occurs and the term paralytic strabismus is limited to the innervational causes of the restricted motility okay but the incommitting strabismus includes both the paralytic strabismus and the restricted strabismus for example some tumor uh for example if some tumor is present we will not be able to move the eye in that direction so the incommitting strabismus includes both paralytic strabismus and restrictive strabismus paralytic strabismus is limited to the innervational causes of the restricted motility and the third nerve fourth nerve and sixth nerve paralysis refer to the paralysis of the muscle supplied by those cranial nerves and not the paralysis of actual paralysis of those nerves it refers to the paralysis of the muscles of those nerves if all the extraocular muscles supplied by the third nerve third cranial nerve are paralyzed the paralysis is termed as complete oculomotor paralysis and if even one or more extraocular muscle is not involved the oculomotor palsy is partial if all the extraocular muscles are paralyzed it is known as external ophthalmoplegia if all the intrinsic ocular muscles such as the iris muscles and the this uh, ciliary muscles are paralyzed it is known as internal ophthalmoplegia if both the extrinsic and the intrinsic muscles are paralyzed it is known as complete ophthalmoplegia so the next cause of incommitting strabismus is mechanical restrictive strabismus in which there is a structural alteration of the muscle itself or of its antagonist and thus it may limit its ability to function normally and its action may be lost next in the next video we will study about amblyopia